for those plane tickets? You're not gonna convince me that some girl working is not gonna call an airline and put your name on some tickets and sit there and change the ticket three times if she has not been told that you're actually gonna show up. That didn't happen. And they end up having sex in your car? <laughs> yes, Your Honor. Is that true, Ms. Davenport? Yes, Your Honor. Is that true, Mr. Johnson? Yes, Your Honor. Oh. But that was her stipulation. He couldn't, no, she checked like, his phone and told him. No, I was just trying to be a stand-up guy at the end of the day. No. Oh, you was trying to be a stand-up guy. Yeah. <laughs> Heck of a start. Mr. Taylor kicks things off by telling the court how Ms. Jackson hit him with a bombshell while she was nine months pregnant. She first said he might not be the dad of her baby, Raymond, but then changed her mind and claimed he actually was the father. And now, he's here to figure out what's going on. Spoiler alert, this drama is just getting warmed up. Mr. Taylor, you say your fiance say Ms. Jackson dropped a bombshell on you when she was nine months pregnant and told you that you may not be her child's father. And while you're hoping he's yours, you're here today to prove that Raymond is not your biological child. No. The drama level went from zero, 100 real quick. Mr. Taylor pours his heart out, saying he's been there for Raymond from day one, acting like a dad in every way. But now, he's worried that if the DNA test says Raymond's not his, he's walking out of court as a single man. It's like watching a soap opera live. And trust me, the emotions are only about to get messier. Do everything for this child. And the only thing that I do know is that if this child ain't mine, I'll be walking out this courtroom today a single man. You all are engaged. You have a family together. So there is a lot at stake here. Yes, Your Honor. In your opinion, do you believe he has a right to doubt this? Yes, I do, Your Honor, because I gave him the right to doubt it, but I feel that he knows how much I care for him. Okay, things just got wild. Ms. Jackson admits she hooked up with Mr. Green after meeting him in a shelter. She said Mr. Taylor left her stranded when he ran off to Atlanta, so she turned to Mr. Green for comfort. This story is getting complicated fast, and it's only a matter of time before it all blows up. A few years ago, we just packed up and we moved to Florida for a fresh start. I met Mr. Green, a shelter. We ended up becoming intimate, but Mr. Taylor left me and my children stranded in Florida while he went away to, I guess, chase his dreams, Your knowing Honor, that we had something? nobody and knowing that we had nothing. And here's where things get even crazier. Mr. Taylor drops the bomb that Ms. Jackson slept with Mr. Green just three days after he left for Atlanta. He's pointing out dates, saying she got pregnant real quick after he left, but she's denying it happened that fast. Oh man, you know it's about to get real messy when people start arguing about dates and times. A few weeks. Three days later, she was pregnant by October 12th. I left September 14th. That was less than a month. No, That's I a knew lie. If he would have never left us there in the first place, this whole situation could have been avoided. If he would have just been a man about the situation, they have no money. Leave a message. So leave a message and say, away. I'm going to go. He's going to I call your money. Let's get some order. Job. Wait. What? Mr. Taylor says he found out about Ms. Jackson's pregnancy from some random dude on Facebook. Apparently, the guy messaged him, telling him she might be pregnant by Mr. Green. Taylor confronts her about it, and now everything is out in the open. But seriously, who finds out they might not be the dad from Facebook? Only in paternity court, folks. Well, a guy that was on Facebook, he inboxed me, basically telling me that LaJoy was pregnant by Mr. Green. That was my first time even hearing about it. I confronted her. You've been talking yes. to her on the phone? Yes! And she's never mentioned I'm pregnant? No! But I confronted her about it. We didn't have a lot of contact with each other. Yes, I was still having a lot of, you know, emotional depression good, over she our good, good relationship. Facebook contact saying it was Umar Jr. though. Oh, and just when you thought it couldn't get any juicier, Mr. Green strolls into the courtroom. He confirms that, yep, he and Ms. Jackson did have a thing while she was staying in the shelter. According to him, she told him Mr. Taylor ditched her for a rap career. Yep, you heard that right, a rap career. And Mr. Green felt sorry for her. This just keeps getting better and better. I guess I met her in the shelter, and she, and she when I met her, she told me that he had left her for a rap career in Atlanta just left and didn't want, want nothing to do with her, had nothing to do with her, didn't want to take care of the kids. So I sat there and I felt bad, you know, we vibed and then I, I was going through stuff with my baby mom at that time. Then it went to, a, then, and then it got to a physical level. When we left the shelter, got, you know, I got my, my, my place, my condo, you know, your bathroom by myself. I got that. Oh snap, Ms. Jackson just dropped the truth bomb. She's not sure who the baby's father is because, well, she slept with both of them. Yeah, you heard that right. She was telling both guys they were the dad, but now she's admitting she doesn't really know. This is the kind of confession that leaves everyone in the room staring at each other like, did she just say that? Your Honor, I don't know which one is the father because okay. I had sex with both of them. Right. Thank you, just to tell the truth. So the bottom line is, is you really don't know. You yes, told I him he was the father. You messaging him as well. That's but, the truth. But, but, you like, signed the birth certificate. No, I didn't. Glad I was away for me not to sign it because I probably would have signed it and probably would have paid child support. But like, now, I, Mr. I Taylor, you have stepped up to the plate. And here comes the moment of truth. And let me tell you, it did not disappoint. The DNA results come in and boom. It has been determined by this court. His biological father 
father is Mr. Green. A figure. This part was a total roller coaster. Ms. Rice shows up in court to prove that Mr. DeBaca is the dad of her unborn baby. She says he's a cheater who even posted ads looking for new girlfriends while she was pregnant. On top of that, she wants $750 for plane tickets and money she lent him. And just when you think that's crazy, wait until you hear what Mr. DeBaca has to say. Ms. Rice, you are appearing in court to prove the defendant, Mr. DeBaca, is the father of your unborn baby. You claim he has denied paternity. In addition to the paternity suit, you were also asking the court to award you $750 for plane tickets and a loan to Mr. DeBaca. Yes. Things started getting awkward real fast. The court finds out that Ms. Rice and Mr. DeBaca met through an online ad and he claims they were only friends with benefits. But Ms. Rice thought they were headed towards a real relationship, even though they were already living together. If you think that sounds confusing, just wait. It gets weirder. It began about a year and a half ago. I responded to an ad on the internet. He was looking for friends. I went over to his house. We started hanging out. I asked me to have sex with him okay, and please. he kept asking me okay. and asking me and I told him no I do not sleep with guys on the first night and I said that way more than once. She gave into it. She's I not finally gave She's in. She's not an adult. She just happened to just give into my, my so saying. So ended up having sex. Yes. The drama here just kept coming. Mr. DeBaca says he's not sure the baby is his because Ms. Rice had a lot of guy friends and had supposedly been pregnant after their breakups before. He says every time they broke up she'd call him a couple of weeks later with pregnancy news. If you're scratching your head trust me this story's only going to get more complicated from here. It seems Every five minutes I talk to her or we break up, she's pregnant. She wants to call me a couple weeks later and tell me she's pregnant. Every time that it happens, she's trying to trap me into it, so I just... I'm not trying to trap you. Maybe if you'd own up to what you're doing. And the reason I left, because she was texting guys telling them to come over, and her and her friend, her roommate, went off to this army base. They're the only two girls there. If you thought the last bit was messy, hang on. Ms. Rice calls out Mr. DeBaca for using her phone to post online dating ads, sneaking out to take photos to post for other girls. He admits he did it but says it was all revenge because she texted other guys. Yeah, you heard that right. Revenge posting. But now, the real question. How much money did all of this cost? When I was over there, I was looking through a phone, and she has she had a picture of, of someone dude in her phone. Wasn't my I have tattoos on my life. How many times do you need to say? So I'm just saying, that's how I knew. No, that's so how I knew. No, I'm just sure saying. He has it down, Crystal. Has. Okay, so you saw, that's one doubt. You saw the picture. Yeah. Money fights are always wild, but this one, wow. Ms. Rice says she spent $750 on plane tickets and loans for Mr. DeBaca, but he says he didn't owe her anything. He even questions why she sent him the money in the first place. The judge has to figure out if this was a gift or a loan, but trust me, you'll want to hear what happens next with this back and forth. How Yo. much did the plane tickets total? $100 plus $50 in the change fee. And you say, Say your suit is for $750, where's the other $500 come from? The other $500 comes from borrowed money. I'd send him $100 here, $60 there, He'd call you and say here. what? Can you send me money? Can you wire me money through Walmart? No. I want chocolate. I want juice. I want this. I want what? that. Honestly, I wasn't expecting this twist. The judge decides Ms. Rice should get $250 for the plane tickets, but denies the rest of the money claim, saying it was probably a gift because she wanted to keep him around. The judge is pretty much saying, nice try, but no. But hold on. The real bombshell is about to drop when the DNA results come in. And for that reason, Ms. Rice, I cannot award you the $500 that you say you sent him because I believe it was a gift. As for those plane tickets, you're not going to convince me that some girl working is not going to call an airline and put your name on some tickets and sit there and change the ticket three times if she has not been told that you're actually going to show up. That didn't happen. This is where everyone in the courtroom leaned forward. The DNA test results are in. And it turns out, surprise. It has been determined that you are the father. What did I tell you? Buckle up, because this case is already off the rails from the jump. Mr. Boston claims he is not the biological father of Ms. Murphy's son, Tristan, and says he's confused about whether they even had intimate violence. Meanwhile, Ms. Murphy insists he's the dad and wants him to stop lying. Things are just getting started, and it's already a mess. Mr. Boston, you have dragged the defendant into court today because you say you have undeniable proof that there is no way possible that you are the biological father of the defendant's 10-month-old son, Tristan. Ms. Murphy, you say that that you are tired of Mr. Boston's lies and you want him to stop denying that he's Tristan's father. You believe the DNA results will be your today. This is where it goes from confusing to downright ridiculous. Mr. Boston starts off by claiming he doesn't remember having intimate violence with Ms. Murphy, but then backtracks, admitting they did with protection. Judge Lake isn't having it, calling out his nonsense, and his story crumbles faster than a cookie in a blender. Stay tuned, because this drama is nowhere near finished. You know, I don't remember even doing that well. Lie. You don't he's remember lying. having 
sex with Miss Mercy. Sudden, it's like, my you was at my house that. all the time, every day, every night in my bed. I mean, I'm not denying it like that, but I'm just saying. Okay, right. so what are you He's saying? Fine. Did you or did you not have a sexual relationship with Miss Murphy? I mean, I had, we you did, know, but we plenty had plenty of times protection. on different occasions. If you thought things couldn't get crazier, think again. Ms. Murphy spills the tea on how she and Mr. Boston started seeing each other, claiming he was thrilled when she got pregnant. She even says he rubbed her belly like they were all lovey-dovey. But surprise, Mr. Boston says he only found out through a random family member, and suddenly we're in, he said. She said territory. Wait till you hear his logic next. It'll make your head spin. When I moved to Danville, I bumped into Mr. Boston. We exchanged numbers. After that, he started coming over my house, spending the night. We had sexual encounters. When I first found out I was pregnant, he was happy. He came over to my house. He's like, oh, he I rubbed my out. belly and everything. I, in the process of me being no, over no. a family member's house. That family member came in the house and told me, well, you know somebody named Teresa? At the time, I didn't know her government name. Mr. Boston's story takes another wild turn here. And honestly, it's hard to keep up. He says he was tipsy when he first heard about the pregnancy and thought maybe the baby was his, but then sobered up and was like, nah, this ain't my kid. Oh, and he checked the baby for family resemblance, but didn't find any. But trust me, this story's far from over, and the next part is just as nuts. So I asked out this child. She looking at me, you know, she looking all sour in the face. Why? So I'm like, uh, who's the father of this child? What's going on? She like you. So yeah, in my head, yeah, I got another child in the way, you know. I'm gonna see how this work out. So after that he little, was, little alcohol uh, but ran still, up off me. That ain't no excuse. I, I said, said I thought about so it. So when like, you sobered up, then you realize, uh oh, this may not be my child. Exactly. Just when you think you've seen it all, boom, here comes the next curveball. Ms. Murphy brings out a picture of Mr. Boston holding baby Tristan during a visit to Chicago. Like, look, here's proof. But Mr. Boston's like, yeah, I'm holding him. But I was just trying to see if he looked like me. Spoiler alert, he didn't. You won't believe who shows up next, it's about to get a whole lot messier. I took a picture. He asked me to take a picture of him and his son and put it on Facebook, and that's what I did. No, so I what is this a picture of? Tristan and Mr. Boston. Were you Jesus. holding the baby just because, or were you taking a picture with your son? I wanted to see what part of me is in this child. So long I was, you know, I was patient about the situation, because maybe on down the line as the child get a little older, I will see some part of me in this baby. I, I still didn't see it. Enter Mr. Gregory, the other man in this wild story, and things officially hit a new level of chaos. He admits he was with Ms. Murphy, but when she hit him up on Facebook saying she was pregnant, he straight up blocked her. He was like, nope, I'm out of here. And yet, somehow, this doesn't even scratch the surface of the madness coming up. She texted me on Facebook and told me she was pregnant. I never talked to her again. Like, they did everything, <laughs> so I, I blocked her. You got a message on Facebook that she was potentially pregnant by you and you deleted her? Blocked it. He blocked me, Your Honor, because he had went back home to his girlfriend and he thought that I was going to break up a happy home, which it wasn't nothing like that because I don't want to break up no happy home. This is about my son. Just when you think Ms. Murphy couldn't throw Mir Huey, couldn't throw any more curveballs, she admits she put Mr. Boston on child support, even though she wasn't sure he was the father. Judge Lake is not amused and calls her out for playing fast and loose with legal stuff. But oh boy, the real jaw-dropping moment is just around the corner and it's going to change everything. I ain't nobody did anything for my baby since my son been born. I've been doing everything for my baby. I am a 24-7 mother. My baby deserves to know who his father is. I put Mr. Mr. Boston on child support. You did what? Let me that see I that put drums. Mr. Boston on child support. Why would you arbitrarily choose Mr. Boston and put him on child support when you knew Mr. Gregory could also potentially be a father? And now, the moment we've all been waiting for, the DNA results that are about to blow this case wide open. It has been determined by this court. Mr. Boston, you are not the father. All right, buckle up, because this story is about to get wild. Ms. Mellerson walks into court with a problem. Two different guys, Mr. Williams and Mr. Merritt, might be the dad of her daughter, Chelsea. Mr. Williams says at first, she told him he wasn't the dad, but now she's changed her tune. Meanwhile, Mr. Merritt is sitting there hoping he's Chelsea's dad. Things are already starting off messy, and trust me, they only get crazier. Right. This is when Judge Lake lays down some serious truth, and it's actually pretty refreshing. She tells Ms. Mellerson that she's proud of her for trying to break. The moment we've all been waiting for is coming. The DNA results. Because this can't keep happening. Right. At some point, a mother has got to stand up and take that stuff for her child. Whatever it is, the shame, the embarrassment. You also dealt with paternity issues in your own life. Right. And I know you don't want that for your child. Oh boy, here we go. The moment of truth for Mr. Williams. It things are already getting wild as we find out there are three possible dads in this case. Miss Smith kicks things off by saying she's got three men who could be the father of her one-year-old daughter, Tamia. She admits her life's a mess right now and just hopes it doesn't mess up her daughter's future. The judge 
judge makes it clear we're gonna need paternity tests to sort out this tangled more insane. Miss Smith now says she slept with two guys during the time she got pregnant. She doesn't even blink as she had this drama is non-stop before. This drama is non-stop and it's about to get even messy. Who's on the birth certificate? Yeah. My husband. Ma the results are in and it's official. It has been determined that the biological father is Mr. Things kick off with a bang in this wild paternity mess. Mr. Johnson comes in ready to prove he's not the dad of Ms. Davenport's three-year-old daughter, Malaya. Even though he's been slapped with child support, he and his fiance are convinced Ms. Davenport is dragging him into this for no reason, especially since another guy has already been called the dad. Ms. Davenport isn't backing down, though, saying she knows Johnson is the father. Mr. Johnson, you are here today to prove that you are not the biological father of the defendant's three-year-old daughter, Malaya. You and your fiance they say Ms. Davenport is putting you on child support even though she already confirmed another man is the biological father. Oh, here comes the first big twist. The kid calls someone else daddy. Ms. Davenport casually drops the bomb that Malaya calls her current boyfriend daddy, even though Mr. Johnson is supposedly the biological father. This whole situation just got a lot more confusing, as now the child's got a different idea of who her dad is. Things are heating up, but hold tight, it's gonna get even spicier. Who does Malaya think is her dad now? Because she's three. My current boyfriend right now. Because he's been there before I was pregnant. He was at the hospital with her. And he was there when you were pregnant? Yes. Was he there before you got pregnant? No. What was the nature of your relationship? We worked at a job together and everything was copacetic at first until like years later, I started noticing infidelity, a lot of lies. Social media drama incoming. Mr. Johnson reveals he didn't even hear about Malaya's birth from Ms. Davenport. He found out through Facebook. Ms. Davenport posted pictures with another guy calling him daddy while in the hospital with the baby, which really messed with Mr. Johnson's head. No wonder he's confused, right? But hang on, this drama's just getting started. Next up, some juicy cheating accusations. He only, cause after I had the baby, I posted pictures on Facebook, Chris and Malaya, saying that he was a dad. Oh, this is what you put on yes. social media? Daddy and Malaya. She did, she just don't wanna speak on it, but basically we were in contact. She said that uh, she would let me know when Malay was born. And I, I did not let him know. The next following day on social media through everybody else and family members. Oh boy, it's about to get even more awkward. Ms. McIver, that's Johnson's fiance, steps up and accuses Ms. Davenport of sending spicy pictures and flirty texts to Johnson while he's with her. It's messy, it's dramatic, and honestly, it's a lot. The tension in the room is sky high and the accusations keep flying. Just when you think this case couldn't get more dramatic, here comes a shocker involving a wild favor story. Ms. McIver, what did you say? Malia, yeah, she'll send him pictures of her in her lingerie, send her pictures of what she done cooked no, for no. dinner, talking about some, oh, you wish a girl could cook like this. Malia was texting me all the time. And you were calling him all day, all he, night, uh, he, uh, talking no, about it's about the baby at three o'clock in the morning. Hold on, texting at three o'clock in the morning, sending in the morning, pictures of lingerie? Texting. From the get-go, it was drama. Okay, things just went from messy to what the heck is happening here. Mr. Johnson straight up claims Ms. Davenport wanted him to do certain favors. You know what I mean, in exchange for letting him see Malaya. Ms. Davenport calls it all a big fat lie, but seriously, how did we even get here? And if you thought that was shocking, just wait until you hear what happened in a parked car. Yeah, I'm not even kidding. Someone that's in her life regularly? As much as possible, but not regularly, because of course, Tiffany, every time she gets upset or every time her and her boyfriend are at good terms with each other, I can't get my daughter. Because he, I know he feels insecure because it was lie. a situation where Tiffany set it up where she wanted me to have sex with her in order to see my child. That's a lie, Your Honor. Well, That's lie. not true because you called that my phone lie, back in October and said y'all have sex in my car. Yup, you read that right, folks. Both Ms. Davenport and Mr. Johnson admit to hooking up in Ms. McIver's car. It's like a soap opera in here. The courtroom is shook and Judge Lake's face says it all. She's clearly disappointed. This is just messy beyond belief. And if you thought that was crazy, next we dive into how this circus is affecting the kids. And they end up having sex in your car? Mm -hmm. Yes, Your Honor. Is that true, Ms. Davenport? Yes, Your Honor. Is that true, Mr. Johnson? Yes. John. Oh. But that was her stipulation. He couldn't. She no, you text his phone and told him. He could you not see her daughter. Your daughter. Your Honor, unless she had sex. They are lying on him. She was trying to be a stand up guy at the end of the day. Oh, you was trying to be a stand up guy. Yeah. <laughs> Now we get to the part that pulls at your heartstrings. Ms. McIver, remember, she's Johnson's fiance, talks about how this whole mess is hurting their other kids, who think of Malaya as their little sister. The kids are confused, upset, and wondering where their sister is, which is just heartbreaking. It's clear that this drama is affecting everyone involved, but 
buckle up because the moment of truth, DNA results are about to drop. I mean, you all have developed a relationship with this baby. She may not call you daddy, but... But my daughters call her sister. My daughters still, when they say yo-yo, my daughters are being affected because they look at Malaya like... And have you considered, if I'm not the biological father, what then will you tell the children? So, so I just want the crazy dysfunction in yo-yoing to stop because it's but... affecting my kids. All right, here it is. The big reveal we've all been waiting for. The DNA results come in and surprise, surprise. It has been determined by this court. Mr. Johns, you are the father. Told you. <laughs> no, I uh, no. When I got back home within those first week or two, we had sex like four or five times a day. So you pregnant. had it in your mind that if I get my wife pregnant, she'll stop stripping. Kind of like how she just said, I'm going to strip and I'm going to do whatever I want because that's what I'm going to do. Done. I said, oh, really? Okay, I'll give you a nine-month break on me. I mean, so. Things kicked off wild, and it only got crazier from there. She's certain his denial is all because of his girlfriend's influence. This sounds simple, but trust me, it's anything but. Miss Cables, you say you are 100% certain that the defendant is your 15-month-old son, Jason's biological father, and today he's going to put his name on the dotted line right in front of his girlfriend. The relationship status was about as confusing as it could get. You'd think things would be easy after that, but wait till you hear what's next. What was the nature of this relationship? Um, to be completely honest, Your Honor, me and Mr. Harris, never, we were never in a relationship. Never. Let's clarify that now. We were just sleeping That's together. That's, That's pretty it. much it. Were you in another relationship? No. I was not, no. no I wasn't. You find out are you pregnant? Obviously, you weren't using protection if there's a question that he's biological father. Yes, Your Honor. And right when you thought you'd figured it out, another guy pops into the story. Miss Capples admits she did date someone else, but it was after she got pregnant with Jason. This timeline is all over the place. So who's this other guy that was in the picture? After me and Mr. Harris were done and over with. You were already pregnant at the point you started dating the other Correct. man? Correct. And I have an exhibit if I could show you. Absolutely. Please step over to the podium. Thank you. As you can see, my son Jason was born January 9th, 2016. Me and Mr. Harris were intimate for nine months all the way up until May, the beginning of May. If you thought things were weird before, now it's exhibit a time. But Mr. Harris is like, uh, maybe? Since he was apparently seeing other women too and doesn't remember the exact dates. I mean, could this case get any messier? Mr. Harris, if you don't remember whether or not you were with her, is it because you were involved more than one woman? So that's why you really can't say for certain who you that's were right. with on what date. Now, Miss Caples, I have to ask you, were you involved with more than one man? No, I was not. And he did not that's tell right. me that he was dealing with other women while me and him were talking. So I did not know that he was and playing. Men usually don't tell you. They want to keep getting She went through my phone see. and text other women back. This part, total shocker. Just when you think you've heard it all, the story somehow gets even more awkward. When we contacted Mr. Harris and told him that Mr. Tara Caples summonsed him for a DNA test, he said, I don't know who you're talking about. I said, Muffin? That is correct. I'm pretty sure I told him my name. Would you remember Shantira or would you remember Muffin? Would I go by around I'm town? Good. If you haven't sex for that many months with the same person, Without using any protection, you gotta at least know their name. Just when it seems like it can't get worse, we learn Mr. Harris wasn't there when Jason was born. You'd think things couldn't get more uncomfortable, but oh, they do. Did he get to come to the delivery room? He didn't have a ride, Your Honor. He, he didn't have a ride? Have a ride. No, to the I was at the work when she delivered the baby. The next morning, I came up there and I looked at him. He didn't look like me at all. No, he does and not. And I, I had my doubt. I had been here, my doubt. But like I say, everybody around town says that she goes around saying it's another guy's baby. Did you sign the birth certificate? No, I did not. Because you did not want to or you were not even asked? And here's where the cringe hits max level, as if things weren't heated enough already. Hold on, what is this about the hospital room, Miss Cable? She was undergoing surgery, getting ready to have my tubes tied. That is my job, you. Your Honor, as a woman. I would not want to be in a room with a woman that's having my boyfriend's baby. Okay, so you that's were the patient. You, know, you, that, that, little... you work at the hospital, right? Yes, yes, ma'am. And then that was where they told you your station or where you were supposed to be? You were assigned we to that? Today. We got our stuff to do. Yes, ma'am. Things got intense as Mr. Harris admits he wasn't so sure Jason was his son, thanks to rumors and Miss Capples' comments. Now, everyone's on edge to see if he's the dad or not. Have I heard all your doubts, Mr. Harris? A lot of people around town telling me it's not mine. It's, let's say it, that's how it works. People are telling you if he's not yours. Mm -hmm. Then she even says he's not yours. Yeah. Keep pushing me away while I'm trying to be there for the child. But yeah. you don't think it's he's yours, like though. He's not, so why would I keep... That's the why I don't want to include you. you that's the reason for that. You don't I think don't he's think... yours? All right, that's what we're here to solve today. That's exactly why this courtroom exists. The moment finally arrived and the tension was through the roof. Judge Lake reads the DNA results. Mr. Harris is not Jason's father, but Judge Lake isn't done with them just yet. She's got some parting wisdom. It has been determined by this court. Mr. Harris, you are not the father. Thank you.
This case kicks off with a wild claim. Ms. Bailey, along with her daughter, is suing Mr. Parker, her daughter's estranged husband, for a cool $3,191.50 in childcare costs. And believe me, it only gears where it starts getting juicy. Ms. Bailey says Mr. Parker ditched her daughter when she was 16 weeks pregnant, leaving her to fend for herself without any help. And trust me, the accusations only was with grandparents and with his mother. Just when you think it can't get any stranger, Mr. Parker claims Ms. Bailey's daughter put a padlock on their bedroom door to keep him out. But wait till you hear what Mr. Parker says next. That it shows that she lied to the doctors, lied to the hospital, and lied to me. It's about to be seriously tested. My son, they had one card that he bought. So she would have a card for her and these children. It was this whole thing kicks off with Ms. Richardson coming in strong, saying she and Mr. Smith were all in, trying to have a baby on purpose. Buckle up, folks. This one's going to be a ride. Ms. Richardson, you say you were in an exclusive relationship with Mr. Smith and even tried to have a baby together. But after you conceived your daughter, Kalani, Mr. Smith started denying your baby. Yes, Your Honor. You intend to prove he is the father today. Okay, things get even crazier as Ms. Richardson says Mr. Smith actually begged her to have a baby with him because he thought he might not live long. This wild story is just getting started, and believe it or not, it's about to get even wilder. Around the time we were together for about eight months, he had told me he was in a situation where he didn't know if he were going to live a long time, so he had said he wanted a child with me. Me being young and dumb and I was actually in love with him, I agreed on it. We were together. I had left Job Corps, which he was still in. I left on the 28th. On the 31st, I had sent for him to come in town for the weekend. Judge Lake has zero chill and jumps in right away to give Ms. Richardson some real talk. You just know the judge is about to drop even more truth bombs. You cannot have babies by everybody you feel like you fall in love with. I can see we about three minutes in, and I can see that you decided you had fallen in love with him and from there on, everything you heard come out his mouth, because he stood right here, and the second thing out of his mouth was, I really wouldn't have wasn't trying to be with her that long, but if we wanted to have a baby and she wanted to do it, okay, everything is so nonchalant. Things go from sweet to awkward real fast. And Ms. Richardson says she told Mr. Smith she was pregnant, and he was way too quiet on the phone. He kind of mumbled that he wanted to see the pregnancy test, but had doubts from day one, even though he says he was excited. Mr. Smith explains his mixed feelings, while Ms. Richardson says there was no way she cheated. Drama alert. What was his reaction? He was quiet on the phone and he had asked to see the, the pregnancy test. And so, Mr. Smith, when you got this news that she was pregnant, was the, it the news you wanted to hear? Were you excited about having a baby? I actually was excited. At what point do you feel doubtful then? Well, I was doubtful at the first. You were? Yes, I was. And now, Mr. Smith's twin sister, Brianna, steps in to pour some fuel on the fire. Things just got real messy. She would say stuff that would make him feel even more like Kalani's not his daughter. I would hear voicemails. I would see messages. And what did these voicemails that. say? She was upset at him. She just was saying how Kalani was sitting. She was with another dude and she was smiling and she was happy about the person. Basically in sitting way, in his lap. Yeah. Look just like her. Oh, here's a twist. Enter Mr. Brock, the godfather, who's here to set things straight, or at least try to. But don't worry, it's about to get even more awkward. What is your relationship exactly with Ms. Richardson? I'm gonna keep it real with you. I would die for Brianna. And I'll take my last breath for that little girl up on the screen right there. And that's my goddaughter. And it's just because I've built that relationship with him that quick. We've told each other things that I have told nobody else. Oh, like God, this is so exhausting. So, you all are <laughs> all just kids. Exactly. And everything is so exactly. intense. Next up, Ms. Bagley, the twins' mom, is here with her own roller coaster of emotions, saying she really wants Kalani to be her granddaughter. And if you think that's heartfelt, just wait until the DNA bombshell drops. Do you believe Kalani is your granddaughter? Yes, I do. They always did have problems, but I stayed neutral, you know, because I didn't want to get in between not seeing her because I'm on my son's side, but he was holding the baby and kissing on her. I'm like, I don't even know this guy. Do my son know this guy? If you're a godfather, why we don't know you? Judge Lake calls for everyone to focus on Kalani, saying, all right, enough of this drama, let's get real. The room is silent as they prepare for the DNA results, and you can feel the tension. You all have all been through a lot, and because of that, you all are taking actions, like I said, that really they really don't they don't support Kalani. And in this moment, let's all just refocus as we go forward to these results. Finally, the moment of truth. It has been determined by this court. The biological father is Mr. Smith.
get ready because this one starts off strong. Mr. Hunter opens the case with a big claim. He doesn't think he's the dad of Ms. Holden's son, Josiah. But Ms. Holden? She says she's 100% sure he's the dad. The stage is set for a wild back and forth. Mr. Hunter, you opened your case in paternity court because you say there is no way you fathered the defendant's son. She's only saying you did because of the financial security you provide for her. Ms. Holden, you admit you were confused about your son's biological father because you were given incorrect medical information, but you are 100% certain Mr. Hunter is the father. Brace yourselves, folks, because this guy's doing dad duties even with big doubts. Mr. Hunter explains he's been buying everything from diapers to baby clothes for Josiah. Things are getting complicated real quick, and this is only the beginning. Because I take care of him financially, I do everything. Buy him diapers, milk, and I buy clothes. Everything a father has to do to take care of a child, I do it. So you pretty much stepped up as a father. Yes, ma'am. You have, but you have doubt. But Miss Holden, has he gotten emotionally attached to Josiah as well? Yes, Your Honor. So pretty much has accepted this child as his own? Yes. This story of how they got together has some interesting twists. Judge Lake thinks it's sweet, but we all know there's more to this romance than just cake and good deeds. Well, we lived on the same street. Uh, I met him when I was 15. We both was in a relationship. Then we both became single. I invited him over to my, and he offered to pay for the booth at the party and offered to buy the cake. Did you have any benefits in the back of your mind that you were looking to get later? No, ma'am. You didn't, just a nice guy. Pleasant and refreshing, right, Jerome? Hold up, they can't even agree on what happened the first night. Ms. Holden says they got cozy on her birthday, but Mr. Hunter says, nope, that didn't happen. If they can't even agree on this, it's gonna be a long, bumpy ride. So at what point did you all turn this platonic friendship into a sexual relationship? Did you, you know, what about dating? How did this happen? Uh, the night of the party, we both was intoxicated. Oh. I invited him over, yeah, but that and night, one thing led to another. That night, we didn't sleep. Yes, we did, Your Honor. So on the birthday night, you said you did did have sex, and Mr. Hunter, you say you did not. Yeah, we did that night. Things are getting messy, folks. They argue about using protection. Hunter says yes, Ms. Holden says no. And wait until you hear about how she dropped the pregnancy news on him. Yeah. So were you having sex with protection? No. Yes. Were <laughs> Here we go. You all haven't agreed on one thing yet. Who said yes? She said no. I said yes, we were using protection. No, we wasn't. That's what we call reasonable doubt in a criminal court. <laughs> so now listen, you're having sex. One says you're using protection, one says you're not. Are you having sex with anybody else? When Ms. Holden tells Mr. Hunter she's pregnant, it's pure drama. Just when he thought things couldn't get worse, she tells him there might be another dad possibility. Get ready for a bombshell about the birth certificate. So when you find out you're pregnant, you got one one friend that you dating, that Mr. Hunter is aware of, and now you've also made this friend, Mr. Hunter, into a sexual partner. When you get pregnant, who do you tell? Mr. Hunter. What happened? I called him over, and he came over, and I was so sleepy, and he was like, you must be pregnant, because I'm sick. This is a real wait, what moment. Ms. Holden admits she put another guy's name on Josiah's birth certificate, even though Mr. Hunter has been the one paying for everything. And yep, we're about to dive into due date confusion. Did you put Mr. Hunter's name on the birth certificate, Ms. Holden? No, Your Honor. Did anybody bring a copy of that birth certificate? I have evidence. Uh, I'd like to see that. This is Josiah's birth certificate? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Hunter, is that your last name under? No, no ma'am. Whose last name is that, Ms. Holden? The other guy. The other guy. Oh, you think this story makes sense? Think again. It's like a math puzzle gone wrong, and the suspense just keeps climbing. In November the 15th, this is when I slept with Mr. Hunter. I went to the doctor. My first due date they gave me was August 2nd. I went back to the doctor, and they gave me August 9th, and I slept with the other man on the 18th of November. When you had the original due date, it for you, you believe. counted back. Yes, that Mr. Hunter was the father. Grab a tissue, folks, because this part's kind of sweet. Mr. Hunter shares that he's grown attached to Josiah, who's just started calling him Dada. What he says next makes everyone's heart break a little more. You know, Mr. Hunter, I can see this really bothers you. I mean, it bothers me because I'm starting to get attached. He recently just started coming to me, so. But you know this baby is coming to you because he thinks you are his daddy. Right. And you're starting to form a bond. I mean, he recently just started calling me dada, so, you know. <laughs> That's a beautiful thing when you hear a child say that. Ms. Holden opens up about her own past and things get real. Judge Lake gives her a soft look, knowing what's at stake, and the audience braces for the DNA results. Because I grew up without a father. It affected me emotionally because I, I was into sports. I didn't have a father figure there to support me. 
And now I have a little boy that might be a football. He need a father there to support him. And your fear is Mr. Hunter will leave or not yes. be as present in this child's life if it's not his biological child? Yes, Your Honor. Talk about a jaw dropper. It has been determined by this court. Mr. Hunter, you are not the father. Yes. Oh boy, you're not gonna believe what you're about to see here. She's hoping to save their family by proving he's the dad, while Mr. Cottle says if he isn't, he wants his name off the birth certificate ASAP. And trust me, this is just the warm-up. Mr. Cottle, you say you're not a doctor, but when a woman is having sex with more than one man at the same time, the odds are against you. And once the results reveal you aren't the father, you want your name off the birth certificate. Just when you think it can't get crazier, Ms. Wolf talks about her ex, Lucas, cheating on her with her friend. So she took it as her sign to get back at him. Trust me, things are only heating up. We met on a dating site and I moved in with him about, about a week after meeting him. Two weeks in a relationship, I invited my friend to come hang out with me. While I was sleeping, I, I woke up and I went to the bedroom door. The door was locked, so I kept pounding on the door for them to open it. And I saw my friend's underwear on the floor. So all right then and there, I knew that they had sex. And then I asked them, I was like, yeah, we did have sex, I'm sorry. Just when you think there can't be more people involved, here comes Mr. Chittum, Ms. Wolf's ex-boyfriend who's ready to tell his side of this tangled story. If you think it's a lot now, wait till you see what's next. You were in a relationship with Miss Wolf first. That is correct, Your Honor. And you started a sexual relationship? Yes, Your Honor. And then she said she invited her friend to come and you and the friend slept together. That is correct. So now how do you find out that Miss Wolf was then intimate with your friend, Mr. Cottle? Uh, one of my friends uh, texted me. What did she say? She was pretty much denying it all. The judge pulls out some Facebook photos that make the whole thing even wilder. And yep, things just keep getting weirder from here. Thing is the court uncovered a couple of Facebook photos. Now this is you, Ms. Wolf, kissing Mr. Chittum. Yes. Sir. And on the bottom of that screen, which you can't see, you were a Dallas Cowboy fan. Yes, Your Honor. Then we uncovered this photo. This is you and Mr. Cottle in pretty much the exact same pose, but a different team, because this one says Seattle Seahawks. All right, so here's where things get real. Ms. Wolf tries to deny it, but the polygraph says otherwise, making Mr. Cottle wonder what else he might be missing. Just wait, though. There's more to come. Mr. Chittum, you met with a certified polygraph expert, and you were asked the following question. Did you have sexual intercourse with Ms. Wolf during her pregnancy with Zane? You said yes. The lie detector determined you were being truthful. Yes, that is truthful. Only up to I was pregnant, and you knew that. Things take a cringe-worthy turn when Judge Lake reads some pretty spicy messages Ms. Wolf sent Mr. Chittum. Spoiler alert, it's about to get even messier. So this message uh, was from approximately three weeks ago. Are you joking me? He does nothing for you? God, he got me so angry. Come blank me. <laughs> it doesn't say talk, but it says come blank me. He answers why, and you answer I need blank. This next part has everyone in the courtroom's jaws dropping. Trust me, this story is one for the books, and there's still more to go. So, Miss Wolf, why are you so convinced Mr. Chittum is not Zane's biological father? I have evidence. Oh, you have an... This conception calculator indicates you were ovulating between the 22nd and the 27th? Yes, Your Honor. And you tracked this. I mean, it is possible I it for and a I woman... I planned it, yes. Oh, you tracked it and you planned it? Yes, I... Because at the time, I loved Lucas, and I knew he couldn't have kids, and I wanted us to have a family. It's time for the DNA reveal, and no one's breathing in this courtroom. Judge Lake opens the envelope, and guess what? It has been determined by this court. The biological father is Mr. Cottle. Told you, you are the biological father. Oh, buckle up, because this case is wild from the start. He's here asking for a paternity test to figure things out. But hold on to your popcorn. It's about to get even juicier. Mr. Threlkeld, you state that while you were out of the country serving in the military, your wife paraded around town with other men. And she has admitted to cheating multiple times. You claim you are not sure if you are the father of her third child, 18-month-old Liliana, and have asked the court for a paternity test. This story is so crazy it sounds made 
made up. But here we go. While he was in Afghanistan, Mr. Threlkeld got a super random tip that his wife was stripping. And trust me, the courtroom isn't ready for what Mrs. Threlkeld has to say next. Actually, ma'am, um, I was overseas in Afghanistan. A soldier of mine came up to me and tapped me on the boot and said, hey, I need to go outside. We need to talk right now. Me and him got into some words, so I thought we were going to, you know, settle it. Well, it turns out his wife and my wife were friends, and she had found out that she was actually stripping as we spoke. At the time, the internet lounge got on Facebook and asked her, hey, you know, is, is it true you're doing what I told you I didn't want you doing at all? Wait till you hear this. She says she wasn't doing anything wrong, but only started exotic dancing because her husband wasn't bringing in enough cash. Her reasons don't really make it better, and you just know things are about to get even messier. First every of all, girl we says. were done. He hacked my Facebook. He invaded my privacy. He looked into out. my stuff, into my messages. So, so that's how he found out. What did he find? There were messages, but... Actually, ma'am, see, she's gonna... No. Say, that's already a lie. She actually... I got on there, and on the inbox, that's I see... Not. Oh, baby, I can't wait to see you later on tonight. I had a great time with you. I went together. It's been amazing. These are and the messages you're yes, ma'am. seeing. And here's the part where they th totally disagree on whether they were done or not. Just wait, because what he says next is about to make everything way more complicated. You thought your marriage was over. Stuff as it may yes, be. Yes, Because you all had an argument about you stripping and you yes. hung up. We hung up and we wow. said it was done because I wanted to do what I wanted to do. We, you wanted to do what you wanted to exactly. do. Exactly. And why is it that you wanted because to strip? Because we got married too young. Well, I needed to she because... She wanted to be a hooker no. in training, Will so you she just let me stripping? talk. Well, no, I... Uh, no. Just when you think it can't get sadder, we find out about Mr. Threlkeld's heartbreaking return. His frustration only grows, and things are far from over as they head to the next explosive moment. When I actually went out, the day I was supposed to come back home from overseas, we were told before we even got on the plane that the news was going to be there. I get there, and not my father, my mother, my wife, like I said, we'll quote that, weren't even there. You know, they call everybody's names up, everybody's clapping and cheering, they come to my name, and it's just dead quiet. No one was there. So as everybody's getting ready to go home, I'm sitting over there with my bags. I didn't even have a phone yet, so I couldn't even call her. I'm sitting there under a streetlight, army bag on my on one side and a suitcase on the other. Now this part is straight out of a soap opera. He decides to call up the guy his wife's been chatting with, but it's not exactly the convincing response he was hoping for, and things just keep heating up with the next argument. Because I saw the guy, she hadn't fully admitted that she's been seeing this guy, so I snatched the phone from her and I started going through it. There was a number that she'd called like 13 times. So I called him right back, mm -hmm. and he answers the phone, hey, you know, I said, who is this? Are you the one that's... And now now her defense, she starts laughing, saying, ha, I knew he was just going to say that. He's just saying that to, to make you mad. And it was ridiculous. I mean, that was just the only So defense. when he calls the guy on the phone, you deny. You know, what was he thinking? Kind of moment. Mr. Threlkeld reveals he thought a baby might actually fix things. His plan didn't go exactly as he thought, and now things are about to get even more awkward. When I got back home within those first week or two, we had sex like four or five times a day. So you pregnant. had it in your mind that if I get my wife pregnant, she'll stop stripping. Roger, because because that's going to definitely well, what she be tells me, a professional. Like she just said, kind of like how she just said, I'm going to strip and I'm going to do whatever I want because that's what I'm going to do. Done. I said, oh, really? Okay, I'll give you a nine-month break on me. I mean, so. Here's where the drama gets cranked up. He wanted her to take a lie detector test to settle his doubts once and for all. The shocking stuff just keeps coming as we finally get closer to finding out the truth about Liliana. Mr. Threlkel, you asked your wife to take a lie detect test at some point. Before she came back, I said, look, you know, obviously the path we're going down right now isn't a good one. My insecurities, I'd like you to take a lie detector test. And she she kept saying, oh, yeah, it's fine, I'll do it, you know, no big deal. She starts, you know, getting nervous. I could start telling from body language and, you know, the tone of her voice, she was getting nervous. We don't she need tells a lie detector test, out, we just need communication. This is where it gets brutal. Mrs. Threlkeld admits there's only a 50-50 chance that Liliana is her husband's daughter. It's a super tense moment for everyone in the room, and just when you think you can't take any more, it's finally time for the big reveal. Do you think, honestly, that he is the father of Liliana? It could be a 50-50 chance, honestly. Your Anybody honor. got a quarter? Do you understand that for a man, for any person, that that would be really hard to accept? There is a part of me that listens to you both talk and sees that one, if not both of you, maybe still wants to make this work. And here's the moment everyone's been waiting for. Pertaining to one-year-old Liliana, Mr. Threkel, you are Liliana's father. Well, I, I came out the car. I seen somebody jump out the window, and I'm knocking on the door for like... But you gotta knock on your own door. Exactly. I'm looking at them look, run through the field. At least 30 <laughs> minutes to open up the door. Yeah. I don't have no problem with her. She's laughing and giggling like it's a joke. Yo, kids, grew up with their father. I did it. And act like it's my mama's fault. Because at the end of the day, we lost 50. 
13 were those two months. For his first child, Terry, Michelle, and the name needs to be changed to Freeman. You need to grow up and be a man. Survive. This woman dictates to you this about one. just be there for your son. You like to clown? Your son will love it. He loves to laugh and play. Can you handle this? Miss Whalen admits to a steamy affair with Mr. LeBlanc, who's already hitched, claiming he's the daddy of her little tyke, Vincent. Mr. LeBlanc, desperate to save his marriage, is set on proving he's not the father, while Mrs. LeBlanc is totally over it, stating if the DNA test shows hubby is the dad, she's out of there. Ms. Whalen, you admit you've been in a sexual relationship with Mr. LeBlanc, a married man, and claim he is the father of your two-year-old son, Vincent Whalen. You are determined to prove that you are not father of Miss Whalen's son in hopes of saving your marriage. You are at your breaking point and say, if the DNA proves your husband is the father, your marriage is over. Hold on to your popcorn. Miss Whalen spills the beans about how she dropped the pregnancy bomb on Mr. LeBlanc during a particularly cozy night. She's freaking out about how to break the news while he's sweating bullets about the whole ordeal. Stick around because the drama in the courtroom is about to heat up even more. It was one night telling him that I might be pregnant because I hadn't started my ministry and got some pregnancy test. Asked me to take him. He sat on side of my bed holding his head. When I took the first one, I gave it to him and it showed that I was pregnant. He asked me to take another one because he was in disbelief about the first one, so I took another one. You can't be pregnant. It's only because he didn't know how he was going to go back and tell his wife that I was pregnant. Heated argument between the parties. Did you see that coming? As the room heats up, Ron, the court officer, jumps in to stop Miss Whalen and Mrs. LeBlanc from turning the courtroom into a wrestling ring. The judge steps in to scold everyone, reminding them this isn't just about them. It's about the kids, too. Keep watching. Fireworks are about to get even wilder. He knew he could do that over there. He, he kept putting that he over here. Over with, there, he knew he could do it. With Zay. It's love. Feelings you can love. put in your pocket and throw away. Love Feelings you can put in your pocket. Go you can throw them on the ground. Stop love. I love my mother. Keep forth, but keep all y'all look crazy because you sit up there arguing back and forth. He doing nothing but running back and forth. It's not even solving anything. Outs about paternity due to rumors. You're not gonna believe this twist. Mr. LeBlanc throws a curveball, questioning Vincent's paternity based on neighborhood gossip that Miss Whalen might have had a fling with the guy next door. The plot thickens with this added layer of drama, suggesting that maybe, just maybe, there's more to the story. The next reveal is a doozy. Don't miss it. Very promiscuous, like I said. The mailman, not only that, you sleeping with a married man. You it came to you because you were easy. It's Hold on, Miss LeBlanc. He couldn't do what he wanted to do. You're saying this marriage is over, finally done? I'm finally, I'm at my breaking point. Grab your tissues, or maybe not. Miss Whalen opens up about how messed up this whole situation has made her feel, from her self-worth to her living situation. The judge isn't having any of it, pointing out Mr. LeBlanc's habit of making bad decisions and the emotional chaos it's caused. What happens next is jaw-dropping. Stay tuned. I mean, it hurts, but then it doesn't, because at the end, I'm gonna take care of my kids regardless. But they didn't ask to be brought here. I love my wife, Yon. I wanna be with my wife. But at the same time, my wife, it's a struggle because it's hard to try to be with my wife knowing there's a possibility that these other kids are mine, trying to have a move forward in our marriage. It's hard for her except, you know, bringing other kids into the household that's outside our marriage. And now, the moment of truth. The DNA results are in. And guess what? It has been determined by this court. Mr. LeBlanc, you are the father. The courtroom buzzes with anticipation as things kick off. The introduction of the case, Hicks versus Smith, sets the stage with Ms. Hicks pointing fingers at her past mistakes, hoping to salvage her relationship, while Mr. Smith strongly denies being the father of her three-month-old daughter, Honesty. Ms. Hicks is banking on a DNA test to prove Mr. Smith's paternity, which he opposes, armed with a bombshell witness, none other than the plaintiff's sister. Ms. Hicks, you say the sins of your past have brought you into court today to save your relationship. You are petitioning the court for a DNA test to prove that the defendant is the father of your three-month-old daughter, Honesty. Here's where it gets juicy. Mr. Smith lays out his defense, claiming he's got medical proof that he's not the father and his ace in the hole, a witness who's going to back him up. When the plaintiff's sister steps in as that witness, siding with Mr. Smith, the courtroom tension cranks up a notch. She supports his claim that he isn't the father, adding a spicy layer to the drama. Next up, things are going to heat up even more, if that's even possible. Mr. Smith, you say you have medical evidence proof you are not honest father, and if that's not enough, your bombshell witness will close your case. The plaintiff's very own sister says you are not the father. Jerome, please escort her in. Can I have you go right up here on the left side? The stakes are high and the gloves are off. During fiery exchanges in the courtroom, Ms. Hicks defends her honor, passionately asserting she knows the father of her children, while her sister throws accusations of dishonesty and infidelity her way. Accusations fly about Ms. Hicks's colorful romantic history, causing gasps and murmurs from the audience. Buckle up. The roller coaster is just getting started. I got something to say. She's telling false lies. I know for a fact. I was guess not you're the there in the same bed with me when I'm sleeping with these people. I get. <laughs> I get. How long have 
got me and her sister. Like, she, they was staying with me for some time. From what I know, my sister's a cheater. She been like that her whole life, okay? I'm Hold on to your popcorn. Here comes a curveball. Mr. Smith spills the beans about a personal medical condition he claims has left him infertile, throwing a wrench in the paternity question. Ms. Hicks counters, arguing their child is living proof he's wrong, which ignites even more fiery debate over his medical claims and her fidelity. Just wait, the next part is a doozy. So you believe you can't have children, and this is what you were told by a medical professional. Did you inform Ms. Hicks about when you all were in a sexual relationship? No, you're he never informed me about any of this. When he did tell me, this came up like two months after Honesty was born. That you can have uh, kids. I, I didn't make this baby myself. As the plot thickens, Mr. Smith recounts a wild tale of another man making a daring escape out Ms. Hicks's window, which he presents as evidence of her cheating. They hash out the details of the pregnancy and Mr. Smith's initial reaction, adding layers to the already complex relationship drama. It's a soap opera in the making, and the next witness's words might just blow the roof off. Well, I, I came out the car. I seen somebody jump out the window, and I'm knocking on the door for like 30 minutes. But you gotta knock on your own door. Exactly. 30 minutes to open up the door. The day he came to the house, he has a habit of losing his key. You won't believe this bit. Dr. Jamila Gator steps up to shed light on Mr. Smith's hypogonadism, the plot twist in our tale of disputed paternity. The courtroom dives into a medical jargon-filled debate about whether his condition truly means he can't father children. Mr. Smith sticks to his guns, but the doubt hangs heavy in the air. Hang tight, the judge is about to drop a bombshell. So hypogonadism is when the body doesn't produce enough testosterone. You can either be born with it, can develop it later in life. Usually from things like infection or an injury to the testicles can also cause it. But nature gives us two testicles, and so usually it has to be a found injury to not one, but both testicles to actually cause hypogonadism. The moment of truth is about to drop like a hot potato. It has been determined by this court, Mr. Smith. You are the father. <laughs> The room is buzzing as everyone settles in. The case kicks off with Judge Lake laying down the law, introducing it as Lewis versus Scott. Mr. Lewis steps up claiming he's the real deal, Crystal Scott's biological dad, though he's been MIA due to some mysterious reasons. He's super confident that the DNA test is about to make him a happy man, believing for years that he's the dad. Mr. Lewis, you say 35 years you've always known you were Miss Scott's biological father. Circumstances kept you away. You claim the DNA results prove you you are Crystal Scott's dad. Here comes Mr. Scott, ready to drop side of the story. He's been there since day one, at the hospital when Crystal was born, and he's been the dad she's always known. He's still hitched to Crystal's mom and bets all his chips that the DNA test will back him up. Strap in, because you won't believe what's coming. Mr. Scott, you claim you are Crystal's biological father. You were at her birth, raised her from day one, and are still legally married to her mother. You say the results prove you are Crystal's dad. Now, Mr. Lewis gets all mushy, pouring his heart out. He recalls a chat from 35 years back when Crystal's mom told him he was the dad. He's been holding on to that like a kid with a superhero cape, seeing bits of himself in Crystal, and convinced she's his mini-me. The drama's about to ramp up, so keep your eyes peeled. She is my daughter. I believed her when her mom told me 35 years ago that I was the father. I never doubted her. I look at her, a lot of pictures. I looked at her, she became an adult. I have a lot of the same characteristics. When I look at her, I say, wow, I see myself. We've taken some pictures together with the other kids. She looks as much like me as all of other kids. Crystal takes the spotlight, sharing her tale of growing up thinking Mr. Scott was her bio dad because that's what her mom told her. She reminisces about fishing trips and vacations that painted the perfect family picture. But hold on to your popcorn. The plot thickens in just a sec. Your Honor, my mom never told me that Mr. Lewis was my biological father. My dad here, he raised me. He taught me how to fish. We went on family vacation. That's one we were in Florida. Just last year, we were there for a family reunion. Well, he taught me what to expect from a man hardworking. Things get real as Mr. Lewis spills the beans about an eight-year secret romance with Crystal's mom, which Mr. Scott knew nada about. Imagine that soap opera twist. This affair adds layers of secrets and drama to the mix, making you wonder just how this family web will untangle. I was in love with her. I believe she was in love with me. I was an unhappy man. She was an unhappy wife. So you knew she was married, and you said you were an unhappy man. I was, I was an unhappy husband. We became involved. We had probably an eight-year relationship. She told me that at seven months, she 
asked me, who do you think this child is? I said, well, it's your husband. She said, no, it's yours. Crystal reminisces about the good old days, like those sneaky store meetups with Mr. Lewis when she was just a kiddo. Mom introduced him as just a friend, but they were handing out more than just friendly hugs. Buckle up, because the emotional roller coaster is just getting started. When I was a kid, five years old, six years old, when she would say, let's go to the store, that's when we would go and meet Mr. Lewis in the store. Of course, it would just be me, her, and I. He would give me five, ten dollars. They would walk a little bit down the aisle, you know, and hug, kiss. And you I, saw your mother hug mm -hmm, and kiss and I would Mr. Just Lewis. Be, and so who did your mother tell you this man was? She just told me he was a friend. Everyone's on the edge of their seats for the big reveal. Drum roll, please. It has been determined by this court. The biological father is Mr. Lewis. Can you even imagine? Ms. Percy kicks things off by demanding a paternity test to prove Mr. Gale is the pops of her 26-year-old kiddo, Tedria. She's dishing out that she's coughed up close to 200 grand, raising her daughter solo, and thinks it's high time Mr. Gale foots some of the bill. You've got to hear how Mr. Gale tackles this one. Ms. Percy, you've petitioned the court for a paternity test. You're here to prove to Mr. Gale and his wife that he is the father of your 26-year-old daughter, Tedra Glenn. You claim that you've spent nearly two $200,000 to raise your daughter and he's done nothing. Did he really just say that? Mr. Gale snaps back at Ms. Percy's hefty claims, explaining he only got wind of possibly being Tedria's dad when she hit 15. Plus, he's sweating bullets over the thought that his marriage might crumble if the test shows he's the father. Oh boy, the next bit is a doozy. Mr. Gale, you claim you weren't there for Ms. Glenn because you only found out she may be your child when she was teen years old. Uh, your biggest fear is that your wife will leave you if you're proven to be the father. You could cut the tension with a knife. The courtroom watches a fiery exchange as Miss Percy accuses Mr. Gale of dodging daddy duties because of his wife's meddling. The spat heats up with Mr. Gale, insisting his wife doesn't block his dad duties. But hold on to your popcorn, it's about to get even spicier. Be with his right. children, to spend time my with wife his has children. never stopped me seeing any of my kids. Every time my daughter calls him, it's like, oh, I can't talk to you right now. Tanya's sitting right here. Right, because I, I mean, don't want to, I don't want to disrespect my wife. How if would I you knew that was my my daughter. Right. This is your daughter. Her. I knew that was my daughter. It's your daughter. I could talk. This just turned into a soap opera. They dive into the nitty gritty of Mr. Gale's past romances, with Ms. Percy claiming their love story lasted way longer than he admits. The judge is on a mission to sort out the timeline to see if it matches Tedria's arrival to planet Earth. It was committed. We were seven years. It wasn't no seven years. You were How long was it? Then? Four or five years. No, it was. When I got with her, she was 16, I was 21. Then when I was 26, I was with my wife. Your birthday, October 9, 19. Mr. Gale, you got married in February of 2002. How long were you together before that? 15 years. Hello. You won't believe this part. Amidst the chaos, Mr. Gale lets slip about his on and off flings with Ms. Percy during his marriage, which she insists included more than a few sleepovers. The accusations fly left and right, contradicting each other's stories about when and how often they were together. Strap in, because Tedria is about to drop some truth bombs. Well, we were still sleeping together the whole time you was with Tanya. No, we weren't. We yes, slept we together one was. time, Your Honor. Still trying to sleep with whoa, <laughs> whoa. That's cute. Don't lie. Oh Ms. Glenn was conceived yes. if you are her biological father well, she during that had time. A, a, somebody else tested. Everyone's ears perked up for this. Tedria steps up and pours her heart out, desperate for some closure on who her real dad is. Her plea touches on feeling left out and her ache for a father figure tugging at everyone's heartstrings. I may not have a, yeah. had a father, but I'm somebody. Yeah. I don't have no problem with her. She's laughing and giggling like it's a joke. You know, kids? Grew up with that father. I did it. It act like it's my mama's fault. Because at the end of the day, when I was 15, when I was two months, you should have been a woman and, and said, this girl don't need to grow up without a father. Grab your tissues, folks. It has been determined by this court. Mr. Gale, you are not her father. I hear me, boo. Holla at your girl. Let's roll. <laughs> what, what you talking? <laughs> Here we go, folks. The opening act kicks off with the case of Rayford versus Freeman, where Ms. Rayford accuses Mr. Freeman of fathering her eight-month-old son, Terry, and then bailing on them both. She claims he convinced her to have his baby, then jetted back to his fiance and now denies the kiddo. Ms. Rayford, you say Mr. Freeman's inability to be honest has landed you smack in the middle of a love triangle that produced your eight-month-old son, Terry, whom he now denies. You say that after begging you to have his child, Mr. Freeman abruptly left your relationship 
relationship, turned to his fiance and started denying your baby. Oh boy, the sparks are flying. Mr. Freeman paints a picture of his time with Ms. Rayford as nothing more than a brief link, slinging accusations that she was not exactly monogamous. He's dead set on the belief that he's not the dad. You'll want to stick around for what's next. It's a doozy. Mr. Freeman, you say Ms. Rayford was nothing more than a fling who is now obsessed with you and Beyonce, Ms. Triplett. You claim that during your brief time with Rayford, she was sleeping with multiple men and there is no way you are her son's father. You're not going to believe this. Ms. Rayford lays into Mr. Freeman, calling him a deadbeat dad who hasn't lifted a finger for baby Terry. She's airing out all their dirty laundry about how he skipped out on fatherly duties. Mr. Freeman hasn't done nothing. He's been a deadbeat. He refused to step up to the plate ever since he got with this trip. I mean, Miss Triplett. Hold on, first of all, of all I of if you didn't even... That erupted from zero to a hundred in a less than one second. Wait till you get a load of this. The courtroom turns into a hotbed of drama as Ms. Rayford and Ms. Triplett, the fiance, exchange fiery words, forcing Judge Lake to step in as things nearly boil over. Today, that this is his son, so he could step up and be the man he needs to be for his first child, Terry Michelle, and the name needs to be changed to Freeman. You need to grow up and be a man. Stop. This woman dictates to you this about woman? just be there for your son. You like to clown? Your son will love it. He loves to laugh and play. Hang on to your seats. Mr. Freeman isn't taking these accusations lying down. He argues he's tried to be there for Terry, but keeps hitting walls, mostly thrown up by Ms. Rayford. He spills the beans on his thwarted attempts to be a dad. Oh, and just when you think it can't get more chaotic, it does. Is this because you do not believe Terry is your biological son? I don't believe uh, he's my son. I tried multiple times to come to Trina house and uh, deliver stuff. I, I brought things for the child, you know what I'm saying? She's neglecting me, told me I don't need, I don't need your stuff. This round's a real slugfest. Accusations fly back and forth between Ms. Rayford and Ms. Triplett, stirring up a storm of jealousy and mudslinging. The courtroom feels more like a reality TV show set. Don't go anywhere. The main event is up next. So you know you every know, move that I man make, so. huh? Nope. Hold I thought on. he made a I wrong so. move when he went over. Oh, you jealous. You wish that was your jealous. son, huh? How can I be you jealous? wish that was your The only thing I refused was on this particular day, he was saying that he had came by once and he had bought a few items for the baby. In your mind, when he brought those things, he was accepting Terry. He was, yes, yeah, he's for the baby. Yeah, he had been accepting Terry. Fasten your seatbelts. Mr. Freeman sticks to his guns, denying paternity and recounting his limited and, according to him, protected interactions with Ms. Rayford. He recounts his generosity toward the child. But guess what? She's not buying it, and neither will you when you hear what comes next. I'm here today to prove that I'm not Trina's baby daddy. Me and Trina was together. It was only just a flame. Trina was still having sex with multiple guys. She's obsessed. He believes you are still having sex with other people. No, it's not true. We met in December. We met on a dating site. Cue the dramatic music. The debate zeroes in on when exactly Ms. Rayford got pregnant, with Mr. Freeman and Ms. Triplett challenging the timeline she proposes. This isn't just a paternity test. It's a full-blown soap opera. How do we end up here? I had to go to California and take care of some business. So we were living together at the time. He didn't have money for a plane ticket because we were in a child. It was not responsible to buy him a plane ticket where he didn't go, where he had a job. So you're pregnant. By this time, in February, I'm pregnant. Yana, she was not pregnant before she went to California. Here's a plot twist. Ms. Rayford whips out a calendar to pinpoint the conception with some major personal events like birthdays and Valentine's Day. She's trying to map out a baby-making schedule. But hold your horses. The next revelation is a real jaw-dropper. February 15th, I'm gonna use that date, my birthday, that we had sex, although it was a busy month. Wait a minute, a busy month? How, how busy was it? It was too busy. <laughs> By the end of it, I was pregnant. I was finding out. We was caught busy, up. It was good. I ain't guy. gonna lie. Two minutes at a time is good. That's why I'm here. Oh, this is my punishment. And now for the grand finale. It has been determined by this court. Mr. Freeman, you are the father. Hey, hey, I know we cannot go through 17 more years of this. Buckle up, folks. Ms. Dallas drags Mr. Stewart to court to sort out if he's the daddy of her little dude, Lamar. She's totally gobsmacked he's denying paternity, especially with his secret double life drama. Mr. Stewart's counter is a juicy one. He claims Ms. Dallas wasn't exactly playing house with just him, hinting that baby Lamar could have a different dad. Oh, the tea is just getting spilled. Keep your eyes peeled for what's coming. You have dragged the defendant, Mr. Stewart, into court today to prove is the father of your newborn son one month old. You say you are shocked that he's denied 
denying he's baby Lamar's biological dad, especially since you discovered he's the one a double life. You claim that it's Miss Dallas who's been from Faithful, and you believe that baby Lamar's dad, any one of multiple men. You're not gonna believe this scoop. Here's Miss Dallas spilling how she met Mr. Stewart, leading to their casual fling, turning into breakfast dates and more. Turns out Mr. Stewart was keeping a little something, something under wraps. Yep, he was married. When Ms. Dallas popped the big question, the crowd's gasp was louder than a dropped mic. Hold on to your popcorn. There's more drama ahead. Up a couple of times. I'm tired of going to the room. You said you, you have a house, you own it. And he was like, you know, I have unwanted company there. So I'm like, unwanted company? I'm like, you got a girlfriend? He like, no. I'm like, you have a baby mom there? He like, no. I'm like, you got a wife? And he was like, yeah. So he proceeded to tell me like, oh, they already, they going through a divorce. Check this out. Mr. Stewart lays it out plain. He didn't think his marital status was worth mentioning. Judge Lake isn't having any of it and schools him on why that's kind of a big deal, leading him to admit he was out there acting like he's single. Things are about to get even juicier, so don't blink. Yeah. Did you meet Miss Dallas, date her casually, have sex with her? It didn't quite go like that. You How know, did it go? You know, it, it didn't come up. You were basically out acting like a single man. I wouldn't act, yeah, yes. <laughs> yes, Your Honor. I'm sorry about that. I'm glad you went on yes, ahead and Your told Honor. the truth. I had to think about it. Oh, so you were out there acting like a single man, but you were married. <laughs> yes, Your Honor. Get ready for a curveball. After finding out Mr. Stewart was still hitched, Ms. Dallas thought about calling it quits, but life threw her a curveball. She was pregnant, with dreams of a happy home dancing in her head. Courtesy of Mr. Stewart's sweet nothings, she stayed. The roller coaster is just climbing. Watch for the drop. We were living together, but we were having problems of our own. Ms. Dallas found out he was married. Did you have second thoughts about dating a married man? Yes, I did have second thoughts, but once everything slower, like, I, I was already pregnant. You know what I'm saying? I love Cedric. He was telling me, like, I'm gonna do the divorce, we're gonna have a house, all this, we're gonna raise our son together. You, I was believing him because that's all I had to do was believe him. Things are heating up. Just when you think it's sorted, in comes a plot twist. A pal starts whispering to Mr. Stewart that Ms. Dallas might have been playing the field when Lamar was conceived. Plus, Mr. Stewart doesn't think the kiddo looks like him. Strap in, this wild ride's about to get wilder. He started out so-called my associate telling him and his wife that I was sleeping around with multiple men when I conceived um, Lamar. Someone that knew you, they start giving you information. But it was the same friend that sent him naked pictures of herself to him that, was that I was sleeping around with somebody else, so why wouldn't say that she want to sleep with you? Wait for it. The plot thickens with Mr. Stewart getting some scandalous pics from Ms. Dallas's so-called friend, who also accuses her of cheating. This bit of gossip makes the friend look shady and adds more fuel to the firestorm of paternity drama. Don't go anywhere. The next bit is a doozy. Friends send you naked pictures, Mr. Stewart? Yes, Your Honor. But that was like, that's one of my doubts. What's your other doubt? The other doubt was when he got here, he don't look like me. He got, look at his hair, he look mixed. He don't look mixed. Look mixed. All babies come out with <laughs> fine. I'm pretty sure. What knows point it. do you have to come clean with your wife about this baby? I her told her. Picture of the oh boy, here we go. Under the heat of the courtroom lights, Mr. Stewart fesses up about his current setup with Ms. Dallas. They're kinda, sorta, maybe living together, but not really. All while he's still legally married. Yep, his wife's right there in court too. The tension's thickening. Next up is a moment you'll have to see to believe. So you and Ms. Dallas, well, you we live, don't live together. together. We, we kinda. Well, what's that? You know what I mean? We like, live we, together, but we you moved go back in and forth. together, but we go back and forth. Like she didn't move out, came Two back. Days. You know what I mean? And Are you all divorced? Still no. married? Legally, we're still married. Ms. Stewart, what do you want? Do you want marriage to work? Are you? I, Roberta knows what Roberta has to do for herself. Guess what happens next? Drum roll, please. It has been determined by this court. Stuart, you are the father. Hey, I told you, baby. I told you. I was thirsty. I got up. I went to get something to drink. When I opened the fridge, I was naked. Her mom saw me. Her mom was like, wow. You were naked in her kitchen and said, why? Wow. Call my phone and said she was pregnant. When she had to go to the appointment, call and let us know, too. What? I, I wouldn't tell no lie. To. We we accept that baby from day one. Anything that you ask us to do we for this baby, we stand up for this baby. You, that's who was gonna stand in the apartment She wanted me to stay in the son. apartment after her son passed you away when she was moving. You when you were yes, I did come to stay there and how when I was saying that and after I moved to my parents' house. Buckle up, folks. The courtroom drama is just getting started. The case Salvo vs. Gonzalez is introduced by the court clerk. Miss Salvo claims she's about 99% sure that Mr. Gonzalez is the father of her one-year-old daughter, Amaya, and she's here to prove it. She stresses the importance of Amaya having a father figure, hinting that this episode could be a real tearjerker. You won't believe what's coming next. You carried on a sexual relationship with defendant Mr. Gonzalez. Desperately want to prove Mr. Gonzalez her biological father because it will break your heart out of dad. Here we go. Miss Salvo steps up and declares that Mr. Gonzalez is absolutely the dad, spilling her guts about how much this means to her. On the flip side, Mr. Gonzalez isn't convinced he's the father, thanks to Miss Salvo's rather colorful dating history, which apparently includes his best bud. Brace yourselves. Courtroom's about to turn into 
a soap opera. But because Miss Salvo's heated lies, you have no idea if it's true. You argue that Miss Salvo had sex with multiple men. Any one of them could be her child's father. The plot thickens. Miss Salvo is sticking to her guns, denying any romantic escapades with other men around the time Amelia was conceived. Except with Mr. Gonzalez. She recounts a single night of passion, which she claims was enough to start the baby clock. Oh boy, keep watching. It's about to get juicier. I've never had sex with any other man but him. I prefer my, I was drunk, he came over, he got me at the right time. You had one time. Yeah. Time for a quick chuckle. Mr. Gonzalez shares a hilarious tale about getting caught in the buff in Miss Salvo's kitchen by her mom, who apparently appreciated the view. The courtroom erupts in laughter, but don't wander off. The laughter's about to be overshadowed by some serious drama. I was thirsty. I got up. I went to get something to drink. When I opened the fridge, I was naked. Her mom saw me. Her mom was like, wow. You were naked in her kitchen and said, wow. Yes, ma'am. Plot twist. Mr. Gonzalez admits they weren't exactly casual acquaintances. They had a bit of a fling while he was technically engaged to someone else. He dishes out details about their trysts, leaving us wondering about the protection protocol. Things are heating up. Stick around for the sizzle. So I used to tell my fiance, I'm going to go to the hair salon or to go get my braids done. I used to go to Ashley's house to go get my hair done maybe once or twice. The whole part six times. That's ridiculous. It wasn't even good. So why would I keep going? It's time for a mini genetics lesson in the courtroom. Miss Salvo argues that Amaya has got to be Gonzalez's because, well, she just looks like him. A lot. She's even got a photo to prove it, focusing on a dimple that might as well be a genetic signature. Get ready. The next part is a doozy. He, like, she looks way too much. The dimple, one dimple just like he does. The shape of his eyebrows, a picture of my daughter with her one dimple. Gonzalez has a dimple. Here, Amaya, I that one dimple. As if this couldn't get any more tangled, enter the ex-boyfriend and Mr. Gonzalez's best friend. Both potential daddies, according to Mr. G. Miss Salvo is having none of insisting it's all Gonzalez all the time. Fasten your seatbelts. The emotional roller coaster is not slowing down. Your best friend had naked pictures of Miss Salvo. Yes, he's lying. Juan, I don't even send naked pictures. I don't ever even let nobody claiming he, he had had a sexual relationship friend. with Salvo. Yes, Your Honor. Were you with any other men during this window besides your ex-boyfriend and Mr. Gonzalez? I was with nobody. Let's talk about baby duty. Mr. Gonzalez claims he's been Mr. Mom, while Miss Salvo calls bluff, saying her fiance has been the real MVP. The accusations fly faster than diapers at a baby shower. Don't touch that dial. The DNA results are up next, and they're a game changer. Formula, diapers, baby carrier, everything. That's a bold faced lie. Two itty bitty toothbrushes and some toothpaste for my daughter. His mother bought that. He found it on the corner of the road. I don't purchase it. I'm not quite sure. And here's the moment we've all been waiting for. It has been determined by this court that you are not the father. <laughs> Buckle up, Buttercup. Mr. Fuller and his mom roll into court, claiming he's the dad to Ms. Nelson's two-year-old Spitfire. Milani, they're dead set on proving paternity against Ms. Nelson's stark denial. Grab your popcorn. It's about to get spicy. Mr. Fuller, you and your mother are here today to prove that you fathered the defendant's two-year-old daughter, Milani. You say Ms. Nelson led you to believe that you were her daddy and build a strong relationship wants to rip her away from you. Ms. Nelson, you acknowledge Ms. Fuller's relationship with your daughter, but you are now certain that he is not Dowd's father and will prove it in court. Yes, Your Honor. Hold on to your seats, folks. Ms. Nelson drops a bombshell. The DNA test shows Mr. Fuller isn't the daddy. He and his mom are cut off from her kid. The audience loses it. You won't believe what's coming next. So, Ms. Nelson, what are your intentions today if DNA results prove you're correct? They will never see my daughter again. Their time just has expired with my child. Wow, that's kind of harsh considering they have a relationship. Barely. Plot twist incoming. Mr. Fuller paints a picture of his cozy bond with little Milani, flashing big time with Ms. Nelson's story. They've had sleepovers and everything. Stick around. The drama's just heating up. I got a bond with Milani. She'll bring her hair to me. She'll let her stay the night and everything for three months. Not three months. I'm positive. You sure? I have allowed her to spend the night then. We live in Fort Lauderdale. She stay in Melbourne. We have this baby two to three months. You got her Whenever she weeks. need us no, to don't. You had her for a few weeks. Here's a curveball for you. Ms. Fuller's been sure from the jump that she's a grandma to Milani, despite Ms. Nelson's fiery denials. But wait, there's more. Ms. Nelson's about to throw some shade. Do you believe this is your son's but biological day one child? One girl called. I said, oh, I'm a grandmother. I said, I never Ms. called Ms. you. I never even had I never to get God, in touch with you. I would tell you. you no lie. You're not going to believe this. Ms. Nelson tells the tale of trying to reach Mr. Fuller about her bun in the oven via Facebook since he ghosted her calls. But hold your horses. Her next move is a doozy. I called him. He didn't answer. I saw that he was on Facebook, and then I wrote him on Facebook. Call my phone and said she was pregnant. When she had to go to the appointment, call and let us know, too. What I wouldn't tell no lie. To. We accept that baby.
baby from day, day one. Anything that you ask us to do for this baby, we're never for hey, you, baby. Did that just happen? Against her better judgment, Ms. Nelson's fam nudged Milani into Mr. Fuller's life when she was just a wee babe. She's not thrilled about it. Watch how she handles this pickle. I did not inform them at all. My mother behind my back called them. Now, once she called them, did they come to see the baby? No, they did not. How did they ever form a relationship with the child? My baby was about five or six months old. I was at work. I was with a relationship with someone. At five months old, when the child five months old, you're in a new relationship. No. Gear up for a giggle. Mr. Fuller whips out texts where Ms. Nelson is all sweet nothings about their kiddo. But don't spill your drink. The courtroom's reaction is priceless. Mr. Fuller, do you have any proof that she told you that you were the father? Yes, Your Honor. I got you do. proof right here. These are text messages. So from Ms. Nelson, I see a message that says, we made a beautiful little angel. I love you, Milani. Then Mr. Fuller says, I know BM, baby. our baby, very beautiful. That must be thank yeah. BM for Milani. Check this out. Mr. Fuller thinks Milani is his mini-me. He's got a photo to prove it, but the court's cracking up. Don't go anywhere. Ms. Johnson's about to enter the chat. Cause she look just like me. She got my nose, forehead. Your Honor, after the five months when they, my mother again went behind my, I was at work. I didn't even know they were in, they were in town. I'm on my job. The other guy who I was with blowing me up, so I'm hearing something's wrong. How can you, at five months, no contact with me, but come to my household where I live? This is the tea. Ms. Johnson, Ms. Nelson's mom, swears up and down that Mr. Fuller is the dad. According to her, Ms. Nelson's love life is messing with her head. Fasten your seatbelts. The judge is about to weigh in. Mr. Fuller is Milan's biological father. Yes. Why do you believe your daughter cannot even believe that's a possibility that he's her biological father? The other guy. When her and the other guy gets mad, Mr. Fuller's baby. Her and Mr. Fuller's not speaking, then it's the other guy's baby. Oh! This is wild. As we brace for the DNA verdict, Ms. Fuller's already tearing up, and the feels are real. But don't touch that dial. The truth bomb they're about to drop is a showstopper. <laughs> Ms. Nelson, it's borderline cruel the way you're acting. Truly really wants to understand your position, but I can't get anything from you. I mean, they are over there crying. She wanted a relationship with the child. I was not even gonna let her be part. She was like, I don't care if not my grandbaby. Let I want speak. a relationship with this child. She knew there was a possibility of someone else. Just when you thought your jaw couldn't drop any lower. It has been determined by this court. Mr. Fuller, you are not her father. I knew I slept with, I knew it, I knew it. Just when you thought daytime TV couldn't get any spicier, Mr. Muriel drops a bombshell. He pleads his case for a paternity test, adamant that he's not the father of Ms. Redmond's toddler, Zedrian. He's all about clearing his name so he can stop dodging baby birthday parties and get back to his business. You won't believe what comes up next. Mr. Muriel, you and your sister have petitioned them to order a DNA test to prove that you are not father of the defendant's 18-month-old son. You have always believed you are not father and the test so you can prove your case. Yes, Your Honor. Ms. Redmond, you say you're tired of being a single mom. Didn't make this baby by yourself. State there is no reason for a paternity test because the plaintiff already acknowledged he was the father by signing birth certificate. Yes, Your Honor. Oh boy, things just got real. Judge Lake isn't buying the birth certificate signature without some tough questions. Why did Mr. Muriel sign it if he had doubts? He spills the beans about feeling cornered by Ms. Redmond's family, glaring at him like he's the last slice of pizza at a party. Buckle up because there's more juicy stuff on the way. When you were at the hospital, Hospital. Did you believe the child was yours at the time? No. You did not. No. You got opportunity and it was time to sign the birth certificate. You went and did it. Why? Because I felt very true. Like everybody sitting there looking at me as like her but family. His mom, was, his mom was there telling him the baby looked just like ain't no denying this baby. Was your mother present at the birth, Mr. Muriel? No. Now, Judge Lake turns detective, trying to pinpoint when baby Zedrian might have been conceived. It's a math problem. Not even a calculator wants to solve. Mr. Muriel's alibi involves a lot of maybes and probably nots stirring up more confusion than a soap opera cliffhanger. Stick around, the plot thickens. I wanna figure this out, cause you saying you're here, you're there. You Let's you try to figure out actual date of conception. Okay. Zadron's date of birth, what? September 15th. I got the year and the date, Does your brother okay. know my son's birthday if that's not his baby? It's okay. Why'd he sign my birth certificate? I don't still question after he signed it. Men, if they stick arm with what okay. they do. Here comes the big moment, folks. Judge Lake calls it. There's enough drama and doubt to warrant a paternity test. It's like flipping to the last page of a mystery novel. What's in store next is bound to flip the script. I want to hear more facts that relate to the doubt in this case. Oh. She got caught the whole nother dude that she's saying she was at her friend's house. This is what happened from the beginning of the story. In my city, Lansing, Michigan, riding around. Pull up to one of my boys' house. I leave there. I see her vehicle in a neighborhood she's never in. I pull my car back. Hold your popcorn because the results are in. It has been determined by this court. Mr. Muriel, you are the father. 
strap in folks, the circus has just begun. Liz Harris is smack in the middle of a love triangle drama with two dudes claiming they might be daddy to her 18 month old daughter. Naya, her main squeeze, Mr. Murray, and her ex flame, Mr. Donaldson, are both here to get to the bottom of this baby bonanza. Just when you think you've got a handle on it, hold on to your popcorn because the plot thickens. Ms. Harris, you have been caught in a love triangle. There are two men in court today claiming to have fathered your 18 month old daughter, Anaya, your current boyfriend, plaintiff, Mr. Murray, and the defendant, your ex boyfriend, Mr. Donaldson. They are both in court today to prove paternity. Here's where the soap opera levels up. Ms. Harris spills the tea about her rocky ride with Mr. Donaldson. They were all lovey dovey until she got pregnant. Then bam, he's got eyes for another, left to ride solo during her pregnancy. She still had Mr. Donaldson popping up at major events, playing the part time good guy. Buckle up, the roller coaster is about to drop. Tell me about your relationship with Mr. Donaldson. From my understanding, we was dating. Then when I got pregnant, he told me he had feelings for another girl. He told me that he didn't want to be with me. I was basically alone during my pregnancy. He was there during the baby shower. He came to the hospital with his mom when I had her. So dating Mr. Donaldson, you're in a relationship. All a boyfriend and girlfriend? Yeah, we were. You find out you're pregnant while in a relationship with him? Yes. Twist alert. Mr. Donaldson throws a curveball, doubting the pregnancy because he thinks Ms. Harris is trying to glue him to her side since he's in love with someone else. Talk about drama. He's got suspicion written all over him and it's just heating up. Wait till you see what's coming. It's a jaw dropper. I felt like she was trying to ruin the relationship that I was. You feel like she was trying to hang on to you by claiming that she was pregnant because you told her you were in love with somebody else. Yeah, sure. Should you find out you wanted to be in a relationship with somebody else before you got pregnant or after you got pregnant? It was after I got pregnant. How long did this relationship last when you and Mr. Donaldson? It was like a couple months. It wasn't that long. Whoa there. Didn't see that coming, did you? After doubting everything from the get-go, Mr. Donaldson finally faces the music when Ms. Harris's baby bump becomes too obvious to ignore. He admits he might be the pops, but skipped out on the doctor visits. The story's about to flip again, so don't touch that dial. By that time, it was too late. She was like big. I hadn't seen her in so long. It wasn't even no point in break getting a- Did you accept at that time that you were the father of the baby? I did. You did. You acknowledged it and you accepted it. I did. Were you active in the doctor's appointment? Go to those? No. No. Were you there when the baby was born? Yes. You were? At the hospital? Yes. And in this corner, introducing Mr. Murray. Out of nowhere, he gets dragged into this paternity puzzle because Mr. Donaldson tossed his name into the ring. This just turned into a daytime Emmy-worthy plot twist. The stakes are sky high and the next chapter, it's a doozy. Mr. Murray, why do you believe you could be the biological father of this child? One day I was on Facebook and I got a message. Jalen, he told me that baby could possibly be mine. So and you get a message from Mr. Donaldson telling you that the baby could possibly be yours? Yeah, I need to get a DNA test. You sent him that message, <laughs> Mr. Donaldson? I'm not gonna say yes, I'm not gonna say no. I don't recall. <laughs> Grab your snacks, folks. This telenovela's twisty. Ms. Harris owns up to juggling both gents around baby making time, but is firm that Mr. Donaldson is the daddy based on their timeline. The emotional blender is set to high, and folks, you ain't ready for what's next. It's gonna be a wild ride. You admittedly had sex with Mr. Murray during the time you were also having a relationship with Mr. Donald. Because during that time, he used protection. From the time that, talking about he could be her father is from a time in December. You're saying the time that you had sex without protection was in December. Yes. It wasn't during the window of inception. No. Here comes a heart tuck. Despite the daddy drama, Mr. Murray steps up big time, playing dad to little Anaya from when she was just a wee three month old. Amidst the chaos, his big heart shines through. The feels are real. And just when you think it's all calming down, there's a curveball coming up. So now Anaya's 18 month old. Who's in her life father? Who does she bond with as a father? Mr. Murray. She looks to him like he's her father because he'd been there. He'd been there ever since she was three months. At that point in time, she was in like a down position. So I just took, took her and her in. I take care of both of you. Everyone take a breath. It's crunch time. It has been determined by this court. Mr. Murray, you are not the father. That's okay. Angela Monroe breaks the ice by sharing her tough situation. Her son passed, and then out pops Shaneka Reed, claiming she's got his bun in her oven. Cue the dramatic music. Angela, the terminally ill mother, explains this bombshell situation. Grab your popcorn, folks. The drama is just heating up. My name is Angela Monroe. My son Herbert died on January 27, 2015. After my son passed, a young lady named Shaneka Reed, which is the defendant, told me that she was pregnant from my son. The baby was born on May 31st, 2015. 2016. I really would like to know if Iana Monroe is my granddaughter. Angela drops the gossip about how she found out about the pregnancy right after her son's funeral. Talk about bad timing. Angela details how she learned about Reed's pregnancy posthumously and describes her initial shock and disbelief. Strap in. This emotional roller coaster is just getting started. I found that after my son passed. 
passed after his funeral. She came by the house, said, I have something to tell you. And she said, well, I'm pregnant. I really didn't know what to say at first. I was kind of stunned because I wasn't expecting that. I believe it was about five months. This was the first time you ever heard that your son, your late son, and I'm so very sorry, lost, that he was the biological father of her child. Yes. Shaneka takes the floor and dishes on why she finally decided to spill the beans about the baby. She recounts her decision to inform Angela of her pregnancy, influenced by her chatty family and friends. The plot thickens, and oh boy, you won't believe what's next. Ashley, after a week after her son passed and after the, she laid him to rest, I called her. I wasn't even gonna let her know that I was pregnant with his child, but I was encouraged by a family member, her only child, that it was important that I reach out to her. So I gave her a call. I told her that I was pregnant by her son, and I told her that I was almost five months pregnant. Now, Shaneka paints a picture of her and the deceased as more than just friends. They were practically planning curtains. She shifts the conversation to their deep relationship, complicating the story for Angela, who thought she knew her son's life inside out. Keep your eyes peeled. The next part is a doozy. That was my companion. From the second week on, hanging together, he already had made it up in his mind that he wanted me to be his life companion. When she was moving out, I was supposed to move into his apartment. Did you meet his mother? Yes, I did meet her. And he introduced you as girlfriend or? No, friend. And the thing about, that was our apartment, me and my son's apartment. Things get spicy as Angela and Shanaka go head to head about who knew what and when. They exchange heated words about their expectations and misunderstandings, showing just how tangled this web is. The tea is piping hot and it's only going to get hotter. Nobody can take my, God took my son from me, so you, my son, to be anywhere else. That is not a person that was supposed to stay in that apartment. It was someone from California that was advised to me. That's who was going to stay she in the apartment. She wanted me to stay in the son. apartment after her son passed you away. You came when she and there when you when were pregnant. I did come to stay there and how when I was saying that and after I moved to my parents' house. As voices raise, the focus swings back to what's best for the kiddo. The dialogue turns chaotic as both parties argue over living arrangements and financial support, revealing a breakdown in communication and a tug of war over who's in charge. Hang on, judge is about to lay down the law. Okay, I'm accepting this baby for the first four months, but then things And you went... tell her she can come and live if she wants. This was when she was pregnant, because my son did ask could she come stay there. I was leering like, you want somebody to just come stay here? He said, well, Mom, she don't have nowhere to go. Your Honor, why, if I wasn't his girlfriend, why would he want me to stay with him? He wanted me to come since he knew I was there with his child. Judge Lake jumps in to cool down the fiery debate, aiming to steer the conversation back to the little one at the heart of this saga. She attempts to restore order and refocus the discussion on the child's welfare, highlighting the need for civility amidst the chaos. The room quiets down, but don't relax just yet. The main event is up next. Ma'am, listen, Lady, let the I'm judge sorry. speak or the case is over. We made it this far. All I'm trying to do is understand, because I will say one thing. I know your son, this is his baby, because this won't just be happening in this courtroom. This will be happening around. Yeah, yeah, and I do not want my daughter around it. You can't. I'm not going to be around. I'm not in a position to be arguing with anybody. I don't have to do that. I didn't lay her at the end of the day. Drum roll, please. It has been determined by this court. The percentage of relatedness between Ms. Angela Monroe and Iana Monroe is 99.98%. Hold on to your socks. They're about to get knocked off. Ms. Wyatt spills the tea that her hubby, Mr. Roberts, is doubting whether he's the daddy of their one-year-old daughter, all because he's been playing the field himself. This intro sets up a saga of personal and emotional fireworks. Just you wait, the sparks are about to fly. Ms. Wyatt, you claim that your husband, Mr. Roberts, is in paternity of your one-year-old daughter, London, and it's driving a wedge into your marriage. You say that you got married or knowing each other for only two months, uh, and your husband is denying the child only to hide his cheating way. Yes, you are. Things are heating up now. Ms. Wyatt paints a picture of their marriage like it's a sinking ship, all because her man is denying their kiddo and gets jelly over nothing. She's pretty sure his cheating accusations are just him throwing smoke. Fasten your seatbelts. Next revelation is a doozy. Now, Ms. Wyatt, describe the current state of your marriage. Your Honor, our marriage is on the verge of divorce right now. First of all, he's denying our daughter. I think it's just to cover up the fact that he, you know, does a lot of cheating. Like, for instance, one time I went to the store, a neighbor, he's 17 years old, and he came hard and was like, hey, Greg just got upset for nothing. Oh boy, here comes the bickering marathon. A full-blown squabble breaks out because Mr. Roberts got all pouty about a teen neighbor just saying hi to Ms. Wyatt. Talk about drama over nothing. This couple's thermostat is set to tropical storm. And guess what? It's only going to get stormier from here. Time out. That, that is so weird. I'm tell you something. This guy likes my you feel me? What older woman let a young guy He was them? speaking. Knowing kids these days, you feel me? Your Honor. They, they don't respect marriage. They what husband is going to get upset because a 70-year-old boy is, is speaking? Like, are you serious? He's a neighbor. 
just when you thought it couldn't get soapier. Mr. Roberts is all kinds of annoyed that Ms. Wyatt's exes are still in the picture every time she kicks him to the curb. His suspicion pot is boiling over, and let me tell you, nobody's turning down the heat. Stick around, the tea is just about to spill. First of all, it's the thing with the exes. Every time, like, we went through a problem, she'll send me home, that's thing you know, the exes is at the house. First it's, of it's, all, I'm never over just to call an ex over. Like, okay. if we get into an argument and he either leave or I make him go home to his mom, which he loves to do because, matter of fact, his mom and his sister, they all watch him cheat on me. Yikes, the plot thickens. Out pops the bombshell that Ms. Wyatt might be window shopping for new hubbies online. She argues it's because her current model is a dud. Talk about airing your dirty laundry in public. The next piece of gossip is just around the corner. Throughout our marriage, he had online profiles. We were talking to women. I've had women contact me saying, um, is that, is, are you married to him? Because that's my boyfriend. I'm like, we're married. How is that your boyfriend? Time so out, when I, I don't know any other online way, honest, I don't know any other way to let him know how I feel. So I tried to get him back just to prove it. And so that he can feel how I, when he cheats on me. Hold the phone evidence time. Mr. Roberts waves around what he claims is proof of Ms. Wyatt's dating profile. Like he's got a winning lottery ticket. The courtroom's buzzing like a beehive with this new twist. Oh, and keep your eyes peeled because there's more buzz to come. Wyatt also has online dating profile. Do you have any yeah. evidence of that? Oh, right. yes, I do. This is a dating profile for Ms. Wyatt, and I'm reading a portion that says, I am currently not looking for a relationship. If nature takes its place, then so be it. Time for a reality check. The judge is putting Mr. Roberts on the hot seat about whether he's really all in as a hubby and daddy. It's a grill session that has him squirming. And let me tell you, the heat's only going up from here. Seems like to me, marriage isn't going the way you thought it would. As a man, I'm not seeing your commit on a very basic level, meaning the want and desire step up, be a husband and father by. Is this the case? No, uh, that yes. a yes or no yes. answer. Here comes the moment of truth, paternity, test results, time, drum roll please. When it comes to one year old London, Mr. Roberts, you are her father. Exactly, exactly.